So hello, um, I'm Jose, and I'm going to talk today here about um, something we have been working on in Oracle in the toolchain team, like for the last um, good five, six months, which is uh, to support the kernel, the in-kernel, you know, virtual machine, whatever you describe it, right? Uh, BBPF, you know, in the GNU toolchain. By the GNU toolchain, well, I mean, you know, like this collection of development tools like GCC, BNU deals, assembler, disassembler, and so on. So this is what we will go, go through today very fast because we only have 35 minutes to cover everything. So let's just start. What is this about, the project that we started in Oracle and we are working on? Well, basically, we have three different phases here. Um, the goal is to add support for eBPF to the toolchain, which basically means to introduce a new target in the same way that, you know, I don't know, uh, x86 on Linux is a target. Well, in this case, it will be eBPF to the GNU toolchain. We will see that we, the support that we specifically added to each of the components. But then, of course, and that is what makes, you know, this target uh, interesting, um, one thing is to be able to generate BPF programs from, you know, from your compiler. And then something completely different is to generate programs that can actually be run in the kernel. Why? Because the kernel, it has a kernel verifier, right? That can reject your program actually quite easily. So that is the phase two. And that is the phase that where we are right now, because we have the target on board on the toolchain, but now we are fine-tuning it so the generated programs can actually be run on the kernel context. And then there is the third phase, which is in parallel with the second one, basically, which is an ongoing activity, which is to expand the support for this specific target. So basically, the general idea is that BPF developers, compiled BPF developers, they should have, you know, a, a, you know, a, a complete and useful tool chain, right, tool set, like the developers for any other platform, basically, even though BPF is very peculiar. Okay, I think that uh, I don't need to introduce BPF here, right? But just in case, because especially the naming part, you know, I mean, it can be a bit confusing. Well, BPF is the Berkeley packet filter. Um, originally, it was intended to be used to filter packets, basically to describe the characteristic of a network packet, uh, to discriminate it. Um, well, especially in the recent years, it's been evolving into something else, which is a much more generic um, sort of um, um, virtual machine that runs in kernel. If you ask the BPF hackers, kernel hackers, they will tell you that eBPF is not a general purpose uh, virtual machine, but everything else indicates that it's becoming one. Right, so um, this eBPF, eBPF, BPF thing is that originally, what was the original restricted BPF for, fil for packet filtering? Now it's called CBPF or classic BPF. The new, more general BPF is now called eBPF or extended BPF. But I was told a few weeks ago, like two or three weeks ago, that now basically we are going to call or they are calling eBPF just, just BPF, which is, I think is good. So what is eBPF? Um, from a programmer perspective, especially from a toolchain person like me perspective, right, compiler person like me, well, ba basically, eBPF is an instruction set architecture, which, um, if you look at it, is pretty straightforward, right? Uh, most instructions are 64-bit long, it's very uniform. There is one instruction which is 128 bits that, yes, it's used to load 64-bit const constants into the registers. Um, but then it has some peculiarities, like for example, it doesn't give you a stack pointer, which is quite weird when it comes to instruction sets and, you know, and von Neumann machines. And, um, it has no floating point support, which makes full sense, because those programs are to be executed in the kernel, and in kernel floating point, you know, it doesn't make that much sense. The instruction set is supposed to be orthogonal to NDNS. Um, it is not, which is a bit unfortunate, but okay. 
and uh, the instruction set is in purpose by design limited, right? It's not like a general architecture like a Spark or MIPS or x86 that is designed, you know, to write very general purpose languages. eBPF is not. It has registers, which are 64 bits. Why the, they are all general purpose registers? But one, which is uh, a frame pointer, which is read only. And this is the instruction set. This is how it looks like, right? I mean, the, same, the first row is, you know, it's divided by the different classes, right, of instructions. It's pretty straightforward, like that. It is small hmm, and simple. Then, like in every architecture, okay, you have an instruction set. But then what about the ABI? Well, um, in the case of compiled BPF, well, what do we do with the compiled BPF? We put it in ELF files, in object files. Now, what is a valid ELF program containing a BPF program, ELF file containing a BPF program? What makes it valid or not? That is what typically, in more normal architectures, uh, that is typically what the ABI will tell you, the PDS ABI, for example, in the case of a Unix system. Well, in the case of eBPF, um, currently in practice, um, what constitutes a valid BPF program in an ELF is determined by what the existing LVM backend produces and what the different kernel loaders uh, basically accept, right? There is a BPF load.c in the kernel, which is in some samples directory, but the main consumer of ELF files with BPF is uh, BPF leaf, uh, which is also part of the kernel. So, um, it is not really documented, this ABI. Why? Because up to now, there were only one compiler producing compiled BPF code and, uh, from C, and uh, only one consumer, which is the Linux kernel. Now, we can expect that there is only to be continue being only one consumer, which is the Linux kernel, but now we have another compiler generated BPF code. And then at this point, I think that it would be good if we start thinking about documenting, uh, you know, the ABI of what constitutes a valid BPF program. Like what relocations are used, for what purpose, uh, the section names, you know, things like that. So we have started the port. So the first, the first thing you have to do when you add a new port to the GNU toolchain is to decide uh, the triplet. The triplet basically is you know, three parts is a name, uh, like for example, x86 Linux GNU, for example, right? The first part is the CPU, then you have a vendor part and an operating system part. Um, in, this, in the case of BPF, which is, is sort of a bare metal architecture, right? If we imagine the kernel as being like the hardware which is actually executing BPF, BPF doesn't run in any kind of operating system. Also, in our case, the vendor doesn't make much sense, so at the end, the triplet became BPF unknown none. And, uh, of course, you can use, you know, which is a good thing, you can use shorter names like BPF NAN or just BPF to refer to it. Once we defined a new triplet, then we had to add the ELF support. So the ELF support, we already had defined uh, an ELF ed identification number for BPF, which is 247 for LVM. And then we added a new list of relocations. Um, of which of those relocations, three of them, which are the only ones which uh, survive in the object file after linking, it, we did that carefully, so they use the same relocation numbers than LLVM. So we stay binary compatible both with programs generated by LLVM. We don't want to break compatibility with, uh, with what LLVM produces, obviously. That would, be very, that would be totally silly. So once we had ELF support, then we had to, um, to, to, to create a BFT port. BFT is a library in the GNU toolchain that basically gives you support for object files. And we added uh, uh, support for 64-bit ELF, ELF files, you know, for BPF in both big Endian and little Endian. Then the next part was to define the opcodes. Okay, um, I come from the... GNU tools cultural meeting, and I am reusing some stuff here, so uh, this is maybe too detailed, but well, um, it's nice anyway. Um, some of the GNU ports are using a, a software called CGEN, where basically you define the characteristics of the hardware you want to target in RTL, 
So in a language which is very similar to what GCC uses internally, you know, as intermediate representation of the programs, right? So well, we define the architecture, you know, hardware elements like registers, fields of instructions, operands, you know, instructions, including semantic of instructions, because that is how we generated the simulator, for, for example. CGEN is very nice. Anyway, so from the CGEN description, we generated a, a BPF assembler, a disassembler. So we have the BPF AS, which is the GAS, the GNU assembler port for BPF. And also, well, using object dump, you can disassemble BPF code in exactly the same way that you would do with any other architecture. And, well, that is how it looks like. Very straightforward. Um, we also made a port of the linker. Now, this is a bit uh, mm, not that straightforward. Why? Because uh, BPF is peculiar, and uh, the way that um, libbpf and the kernel is using ELF, you know, to load BPF programs, it doesn't match that well to the ELF model, right? In ELF, we have object files, which are relocatable, and then we have executables, right? Now, when you compile an ELF executable, an ELF ex executable has a single entry point, which is, I think, minus a start, underscore start, whatever, right? BPF today, it doesn't quite follow that model. Because when you load a BPF object in the kernel, an ELF object in the kernel containing BPF programs, basically, the lib BPF in the kernel expects the L file to contain a set of um, um, sections, and the names of the sections specify where those BPF programs and how those BPF programs are installed in the kernel, right? So an object file containing BPF programs, it has multiple entry points. And when you try to reconcile that, right, with the ELF world, it doesn't work that well. Um, we are going to explode, you know, uh, to explore, you know, in the future in Oracle how to maybe, you know, look for some alternative models. But we got the linker working, and at least it allows you, you know, to um, compile a set of functions in an object file, another set of functions in another, and then generate a third linked object, you know, containing the combination of everything. How useful is this at the moment, at this point? I'm not that sure of that, but you know, in real BPF development, but we are going to continue exploring that, that line. And then, of course, well, the rest of the plethora of the binary utilities, right? You, have, uh, you can make archives, you can get symbols from the objects, you can copy the objects, add in new sections, you know, the typical, like in any other port. Then finally, and this is where we are working right now, um, also we have a GDB port and we have a simulator. We have not pushed this stuff up, upstream yet because it, it still requires work. And uh, due to BPF being peculiar, specifically, especially you know the execution model of BPF, um, there are some problems that we are still working on. For example, because the idea, of course, is that if you are a BPF developer, the idea is that you should be able to do the same that if you are writing software for any other architecture. Let's say embedded architecture, right? I mean, like, for example, to be able to inspect your program with GDB. Now, we will see that BPF is problematic in that sense because the instruction set is so restricted and the verifier is so strict that, uh, for example, there is no way to get uh, backtraces in a BPF program. So how useful will a debugger like GDB without the ability of doing backtraces? Mm. I don't know. We, we shall see. Anyway, we have a simulator. It works, but it doesn't work very well. So we are working on it. As soon as we have the simulator working properly, we will, port it, we will push it to GDB upstream. So it will be released with the next version of GDB. And then finally, well, the compiler. We made a GCC backend. Um, and then those are the uh, architecture-specific options that this port supports. 
Um, I was in the Linux uh, Plumbers conference two weeks ago, and um, I got a lot of feedback from the kernel hackers, for which I am very grateful, actually. And it's, this is funny because, I mean, I am a compiler guy, so I look at the BPF uh, problem and world, you know, from that perspective, <laughs> right? I mean, you give me C, I give you BPF, right? But when it comes to use the BPF and, you know, and, and, and usage of it, I really appreciate, you know, any feedback that they can get. For me, that is super precious, right? So, for example, something that for me made full sense, what they was writing the backend, which is, for example, just to have a minus M kernel option, which will be the equivalent of minus CPU option in other architectures, right? Um, well, apparently, it's not that useful. Why? Because of the backports, you know, that the, ker that the kernel, the production kernels have, you know, like in distributions and, and so on. So, okay, the option is still there. It defaults to latest, but probably will remove it at some point. Then you can specify if you want to generate big endian program, BPF programs, or little endian BPF programs. And also, I added an option there, which is, um, um, well, you know that the size of the stack of a BPF program is limited currently to 512 bytes, which is not a lot. So I added an option, so the compiler will, will basically give you an error by default, you know, if you overpass that limitation. So you know at compile time, rather than at runtime, you know that your program will, be not, will not run on the kernel. Then, well, I also added some compiler built-ins, in this case for generating non-generic load instructions in BPF. LLVM has uh, similar things. And, uh, um, well, initially, you know the function helpers of BPF in the kernel. Basically, the BPF programs are so limited that in order to do certain things, basically, you escape to the kernel. It's sort of a, sort of a mm, pseudo system call that a BPF program can do. So the BPF program runs in the kernel, but then it can call to one of a limited set of, of kernel functions, right, to do complicated stuff or stuff that requires, you know, like writing memory, reading memory, you know, which could be potentially uh, dangerous. So, at the beginning, I used uh, kernel built-ins, uh, compiler built-ins for them. Then I realized it was a bad idea at the plumbers too, using the, the feedback from the kernel hackers. Um, so now I have a patch, I have not pushed it to GCC yet, Substituting, you know, the built-ins by this attribute uh, that you can apply to, to function declarators. And then, well, when you write a BPF program in C using the LLVM, then you always want to include a header file which is called BPF underscore helpers.h, which is part of the kernel, of the Linux kernel that the header file defines helpers and defines some data types and goodies which are generally useful for you. Um, at the moment, GCC is not able to use the kernel header because the kernel header has some stuff that, that, which is, you know, LLVM specific. We are working right now, I'm working now with the kernel hackers on this, but for the moment, I am shipping a file which is bpf-helpers.h along with GCC, um, that should give you the same interface that BPF underscore helpers.h gives you. But please note, before you jump to my neck, that this file is to be obsolete, all right? I want to remove it, I hate this file, but at least for now, temporarily, uh, we actually need it. Does it work? Well, um, the number that you can do see there, maybe they are not that impressive to you, but I can tell you for a new GCC port, this is not bad at all, all right? I mean, this is, um, um, well, the, re the result of, uh, of running two big uh, test suites which are part of GCC. Of course, those are compilation-only tests, because un until I get my simulator app up running, I cannot run the GCC backend, uh, the GCC test suite that requires running the programs, but I will. So, this was the part where I show you what we have done. Now, um, 
I don't know if we have time, uh, how much time we have left. Like Nine minutes, nine minutes. Oh, we have plenty of time, yeah, sure. So, um, BPF is peculiar, right? It's, it's, and that it makes it, that makes it, you know, like, very especially interesting and fun to compile to. So then, examples. For example, NDNS. Um, in theory, BPF was designed in a way that it is orthogonal to NDNS, which makes full sense for something like BPF. Why? Because the Linux kernel can work in both big NDN machines and little NDN machines, right? Now, the idea, the initial idea is like, well, let's make our instruction set agnostic to NDNS, right? So the fields are the same, everything is the same, but of course the values encoded in the different fields in the instructions, well, it follows one NDNS or the other, depending on their architecture where the Linux kernel is running. It makes full sense, right? That made me very happy. However, the way a BPF instruction is defined in the kernel somehow um, basically makes this basically not possible. Why? Because it uses um, bit fields which are smaller than one byte. And in the C specification basically tells you that the compiler is free to reorder those fields freely. And it happens that GCC and also LLVM, um, when they see something like this, the destination register field and the source register field is swapped depending if you build in a little Indian machine or in a, or in a big Indian machine. So, despite the good initial intentions, basically, in practice, there is no one BPF instruction set. There are two, one for little Indian and one for big Indian. The difference between those instruction sets is that in one, the destination register field comes first, and then in the other, it comes after the source register field. Okay, this, if you work in the kernel, using this definition, is not that painful, because it's transparent to you. But trust me, if you, want to, if you, if you make a tool chain to generate the stuff for this architecture, it's extremely painful, because you have, to, you, know, you have to swap those fields all the time. So, fortunately, CGEN, this program I mentioned before to make, to describe uh, hardware architectures, it has a very good support for macros. So, I could tackle that, you know, like, now I have problems in the simulator too, because of this. Anyway, what else is peculiar about BPF? Um, well, this is the function prolog and epilog of a function in MIPS. I choose in MIPS because it's the mo one of the most straightforward architectures, right? Disk architectures. What do you usually? Well, you get a, a, the stack pointer of the caller, right? Then you allocate the space in your, in your frame by, you know, decreasing the stack pointer, then you save your frame pointer, you use your, stack, your frame, and then in function epilog, be before returning to the caller, then you, uh, you restore the value of the stack pointer. Fine, this is the typical that every architecture or most architecture do. In BPF, you don't have a stack pointer. First shock, okay, I don't have a stack pointer. So where is my, my stack finishing? It's automatically allocated, sort of. Um, with the kernel verifier, one of the things that it does when you load a BPF program in the kernel is to scan it instruction by instruction. Then it finds where the functions are, where the function starts, each function starts, and where the function ends. Then it tracks the usage of the frame pointer that is given to the function, and it is able to determine how big the, frame, the stack frame for this specific function is. <laughs> it's super cool because, you know, I mean, this is like um, uh, a hardware architecture that does automatic memory allocation for you. So you, that's why you don't get a stack pointer. You don't need to keep a stack pointer. The hardware keeps it for you. Okay, this which is mm, very comfy, right? Um, it's not that nice when it comes to compilers. Why? Because GCC, you know, I did not like this idea that, that well that much. So initially I was like, okay, I will tell GCC to eliminate the stack pointer in, in favor of the frame pointer. And that worked until I tried to compile the first function using a variable length array or a loca. And then GCC went into an infinite loop. You know, it was very, 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 very sad what happened there. 
So basically, I had to, um, I made a hack, you know, so I'm using the register number nine, you know, to implement sort of a pseudo stack, right? So you can use things like variable length arrays and alloca. Of course, then the kernel hackers probably will tell you, but you don't want to use alloca or, or anything like that in BPF programs. Well, fine. But as a BPF compiler, you know, I mean, I want to really support as much C as possible, especially because recently BPF is getting so popular in different kernels sub kernel subsystems that Really, I mean, I would not be surprised if in five years uh, we can support C99, you know, on top of BPF. Whether that is good or bad, I'm not getting into it, but I will not be surprised. Actually, people are starting, oh, I want to get half a virtual machine in this user land application. Can I use BPF for that? I have heard that more than twice in the last few weeks, so it's coming. Yeah. yeah. Another peculiarity. Um, Basically, in the kernel, this is an excerpt from the kernel interpreter. The kernel has two different implementations of BPF. It has an interpreter, and also it has a just-in-time compilation, right? Which each architecture has one. Um, the kernel, every time one BPF function call another BPF function, the kernel allocates a new, the interpreter allocates a new uh, array, which is the stack frame of the called function of the colleague. Right? And this means that the stack is disjoint, or we, you should assume that the stack is disjoint. Actually, in the JIT implementation, the stack happens to not be disjoint, but you cannot assume that. Right? So this means that, generally speaking, you cannot access the, 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 frame, the, 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 the stack frame from the caller of the caller. The verifier supports referring to it using an absolute address, and that is used I was so grateful for that. That is used to implement passing arguments by reference, right? You pass a pointer instead of a value. But you cannot access the stack frame of the caller as an offset applied to your frame pointer, relatively from your frame pointer. And what happens then? That there is no chance of passing arguments in the stack. So you have a very hard limit of the number of arguments that you can pass from one BPF function to another. You can imagine how painful this is for me, you know, when it comes to test, for example, the compiler. Um, there is also the stack limit. Yes, five minutes. Um, another um, interesting thing, okay, BPF doesn't give you assigned division instruction, which, okay, it should be that people don't need it, I guess. I don't know. But, well, um, LLVM gives you an internal compiler error if you try to compile this code. Uh, GCC generates a phone call, which I think is much more elegant, but as, uh, the same useless, you know? <laughs> um, BPF doesn't have a zero register. Um, I come from maintaining the, the Spark backend of GCC, so, you know, for me, a zero register is like, uh, I don't know, underwear, you know? I mean, I feel uncomfortable without one, but it works, right? <laughs> um, and it has many other limitations. Um, and those limitations are not capricious. You know, it, it, there is a reason why the instruction set is limited like this. But then when it comes to implement the, the, the you know, C on top of this, uh, well, it's fun, it gets funny. Uh, very good news. Um, Alexei said in the plumbers, last week, that uh, a memory model is coming. You know memory model in an architecture? Basically tells you um, how the memory writes and loads are ordered implicitly, or explicitly with explicit instructions. So it's good that BPF is getting a very well-defined well -defined memory model, because that means that I can add an instruction scheduler to GCC. And this is something that I am doing, and it's also a proposal, which is that I have a huge problem. BPF is so limited that I find myself in great pains to test my compiler, because the number of arguments to functions is limited. The size of the stack frames is limited. Everything is limited. So when I try to run the GCC test suite, it's a carnage. So um, 
I'm introducing a new target, an option, which is XPPF. I call it XPPF for exceptional SPPF or whatever. I don't care about the name, actually. Which basically is PPF without the restrictions, right? Um, the main purpose is to test my compiler. Also, using this, you should be able to have backtraces and if I support that in the simulator and in GDB, you should be able to sort of debug your programs before, you know, using the kernel side debugging facilities that Alexei and the others are designing on the kernel side. And also, I think it will be good, you know, to explore, you know, the impact of, okay, what will happen if we change this limitation or we limit this limitation. So this XBPF thing is happening on the toolchain. It's work in progress. So the current status is that the Binutil port is upstream, so it will be part of Binutil's 230-something, I forgot, that will be released soon, and it will be part of GCC 10, which will be released next year. Next step, the phase two I was talking before, which is, okay, now the programs that we generate from GCC should work on the kernel. I'm working with the kernel hackers too on that, because, for example, now working on, on that the self-tests in the kernel, they should work with, with both LLVM and GCC, and they should do the same thing, right? It should be interoperable. And to support the compile once run everywhere, which is BTF, basically. Uh, I don't have time to get into this, but it's actually quite interesting. And, uh, and well, in general, to work with both the kernel community and the LLVM people, so we can um, all together evolve this field of compiled PPF, which, uh, well, it needs, you know, it needs love, basically. And, um, and that's it. Any question? Uh, so what would the simulator be able to do? Like for specific BPM program types, are you going to mock out the uh, context or something? The simulator? Yeah. Well, the, the idea is that we are going to simulate kernel contexts. Because, um, I mean, our main idea is that you should be able to develop and debug your BPF application as much as possible before doing a syscall to the kernel. I am aware that uh, the perspective of the kernel hackers is different in this sense, because they test the LLVM backend with the kernel tests, and they do all the, the testing on the kernel side. I sort of disagree in that point, you know, because I think that we should be able to do as much as possible before going into the kernel. And I think it will be beneficial for the kernel as well. So we are going to, to support some kernel context, yes. I would like to come back to the kernel options you were talking of removing. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, okay, go on. Yeah, they if, suck. If yeah, I, I understand correctly, that means that, in a way, newer GCC would not be able to compile BPF for older kernels? Um, no, that's not like that, no. Basically, if you, if you had a build system, you know, I mean, the idea was that in the same way that GCC uh, tells you that an instruction doesn't exist in this version of the ARM architecture, for example. Then my idea was, well, if a BPF instruction was added in, 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 in the kernel 5.3, right, and then you, you build your program and you want the program to be able to work in the kernel 5.2, then you build with minus M kernel 5.2, and then the compiler warns you or gives you an error because, say, hey, this instruction is not a valid instruction for your target. That was the idea. It turns out that most people are running kernels in production containing backports for, you know, from, Th from future that, kernels. That's an assumption I'm not sure is true, at least in the embedded world. So maybe we can discuss that afterward. Um, yeah, anyway, I think I found the solution for that, which is to support the option, but it defaults to latest. <laughs> so basically, if you ignore it, it's not going to bite you. Yeah. So with the um, stack, stack trace generation, uh, could, could you just have a, like an um, external channel where the 
machine would help you to generate the stack trace if you if you need uh, for debugging. What do you mean with external channel? Well, that uh, you don't try to derive the, mm, the, the 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 stack trace from from pointers on the on the stack, but you query somewhere external. Yeah. It's, uh, the simulator just gives you a list of the functions because it knows them, right? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. Actually, it's gonna have to be like that because. This, the concept of return address in BPF is not, uh, I don't think it exists actually, right? And um, my problem is Dorf in this case, right? Because I found this problem straight away when I was writing the backend and it was like, okay, what is the CFA address? Oops. Oh, oh, oh. yeah, okay, well. And, um, but yeah, yeah, that's a good idea, yes. It, it's, gonna be, it's going to have to be something like that. Or XPPF, which is that uh, I know it's not optimal, but hey, compile your program with minus, X, minus XPPF, then you can debug your program logically, because that's the thing. I mean, logically, right? I mean, uh, the generated code with minus XPPF is not going to be the same that with compiling real PPF, but at least you can do some logical debugging, right, on the algorithms that you are implementing in your, in your program. Of course, currently, BPF doesn't allow you to have unbounded loops, for example. So the algorithmic that you can encode in a BPF program is, uh, well, very limited. But I don't know, it may change in the future. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Jose. We're done. Thank you. <laughs>